So hopefully you can see the slide. OK. Yes, all yeah. good, all okay. good. Good, good, good. So um, uh, hope, hopefully, uh, um, anyway, it's a bit of a canter through some recent, uh, some not so recent and some current track bed research at the University of Southampton. Um, so I'm Professor of Geotechnical Engineering at the University of Southampton. So I was going to just start off with a bit of context. So I suppose this might be a little bit like the safety moment that we often have in a meeting, just to say something about the role of rail in transport decarbonisation. But then to look at some projects that we've done and are doing about trying to reduce ballast settlement to quantify and predict the settlement of the track to look at the effects of the rail support system stiffness and to look at the effects of variations in the track level and stiffness, then a quick overview of some current projects and then to come up with some concluding remarks. So perhaps the biggest thing which is facing us at the moment uh, in political events notwithstanding is that the, the world is facing, I think, two sorts of environmental catastrophe. One of them is in biodiversity and the other one, I think, is uh, is, 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 is our climate, which uh, I think it's now incontrovertible that it's, that it's changing. And so we're seeing all of these challenging events uh, very often for the infrastructure which we rely upon. So our strategy towards that is to try to both mitigate, to reduce CO2 emissions, but also to adapt our infrastructure. And the role of rail is really important. I think it's worth looking at the fact that, re recalling that rail is easily electrified, so it gives zero CO2 emissions at the point of use. And I know that the DFT strategy is very much about the electrification of road vehicles, but that requires them to carry batteries around with them. And there's a whole other question about some of the impacts of that. But whatever happens, there is an inherent advantage which, uh, which, which which rail has, and that is the efficiency of steel wheel on steel rail. That has a huge effect on operational energy, and you can use publicly available data to demonstrate that a Pendolino train uses about 23 watt hours per seat kilometer at a speed of um, about 200 kilometers an hour. Whereas the electric car average is about 45 seat per kilowatt watt hours per seat kilometer at a speed which is about half that. So that's just as an indication that rail transport is potentially twice as efficient uh, as twi at twice the speed. And the other thing is that we have the potential for low particulate emissions from rail because one of the things that we're now beginning to realize is that with electric vehicles, while they might not emit the carbon dioxide, there is a real issue with tyre, road and brake dust coming from the electric vehicles. So in terms of decarbonising rail transport, the focus is often on reducing the operational CO2 emissions, and that's in fact what my previous slide was. But we need to recognise that infrastructure is also a cause of CO2 emissions, and that comes in building it, in maintaining it, and then a slightly subtle thing that the way we've built the infrastructure might commit us to certain ways of operation so that there is some sort of um, future payback of, of CO2 or future cost of CO2 as a result of the way that we've built the infrastructure. And that is something that we really do need to think about when it comes to design of new infrastructure and renewals. So that's the sort of contextual thing out of the way. Um, and the talk is really going to be almost entirely about ballasted track, because while modern high speed lines tend to be on uh, slab track, most of the world's track is actually is actually ballasted and will is likely to continue to be so. So many of you are probably going to be familiar with this type of diagram. So this sort of shows the settlement of ballasted track caused by the ballast compacting and spreading with trafficking. So we get to some sort of limit of settlement and the traditional approach is then to put the track back into its proper position by means of tight tamping. Unfortunately, tamping does quite a lot of damage to the track. It can can cause uh, it can break particles and, and abrade the particles. So there is a, a, a very strong perception based on empirical evidence that the next tamping cycle, we find that we reach our allowable limit of settlement more quickly. So we then have to repeat the whole process again. And what we find is that the uh, frequency of tamping required to keep the track within acceptable limits of level gradually reduces. And then eventually there comes a point when the ballast is considered to be spent or life expired and it has to be renewed. So the first uh, group of work that I'm going to be looking at is about how can we try to reduce that rate of ballast settlement in a conventional ballasted track. 
So I'm going to say give some results of some tests in our full scale sleeper testing facility. So it looks at the gradual evolution of settlement, but also the resilient settlement of a single sleeper bay. Um, so that is about 600 millimetres between the side walls, and it represents uh, the way that the settlement evolves over potentially millions of cycles of loading. And the way that we look at the results uh, is quite simple. So we plot the gradual settlements. So this is the permanent settlement at the end of each loading cycle as a function of the number of cycles. This is to a logarithmic scale. So this is actually about three, two to three million cycles, three million cycles out there. Typically, the ballast layer is 300 millimetres thick. The experiment is usually done at three hertz. That's not to try to replicate any loading frequency. It's meant to be a quasi static frequency. Uh, and then it's an equivalent of a 20 ton axle load. So it's about half of that on an individual sleeper. So for various types of ballast types of sleeper, types of under sleeper pad, we can look at how the plastic settlement gradually evolves with trafficking. So we've looked at the use of undersleeper pads, which can increase the contact area and reduce ballast attrition. We've looked at changing the ballast grading, so increasing the proportion of smaller grains to give us better interlocking. We've looked at random fibre reinforcements, which tend to improve the ballast ductility. And we've also looked at reducing the shoulder slope, because quite often when you look around at railways, the ballast slopes down below the level of the sleeper at the side of the track at an angle of about one in one, which is pretty close to the natural angle of repose of the ballast. <clears throat> so if we look at the under sleeper pads, the blue line here is the baseline test. That's a standard G44 concrete sleeper on conventional ballast. So that after three million cycles, we've got perhaps six millimetres of settlement. And we can reduce that by the use of either um, uh, of under sleeper pads of different thickness. And what's interesting is not so much how much has it settled after three million cycles, but when do we reach the settlement that would be associated with a maintenance limit? And if you took that arbitrarily at, say, you know, four millimetres, you can see that you're pushing that out from 100,000 cycles to, to well over a million. So there are some benefits there of under sleeper pads. The reason for it is that it gives you a much more stable contact. So this is pressure sensitive paper and it indicates the actual contact points between the sleeper and the ballast for the conventional setup with no under sleeper pad. And you can see the red bits there indicate the high stress contacts which are associated with the uh, actual contact between ballast grains and the underside of the sleeper. Uh, and that's after two and a half million load cycles. And there are two points about that. The total area of contact is actually very small. And secondly, there are not that many individual contacts. Uh, that's reproduced in the upper set of three here. And now if we look at uh, uh, the use of undersleeper pads, we can see that we've actually more pretty much doubled the number of contacts and the area of the contacts is greater. So it's still only a fairly small proportion of the total area, but we can see that that's going to be a much more stable interface. And so it's not surprising that it uh, gives us a reduced rate of development of permanent settlement. The next thing that we looked at was changing the ballast grading. So this is the standard uh, grading, which is this large particle size over here on the right. So basically there's nothing really small than about, smaller than about 25 millimetres. And as we introduce slightly bigger portions of finer material, we're not talking about rubbish material here. We're talking about things which have still got a, a grain size of sort of 15, 16 millimetres or above. There are different variants that we looked at in our test rig. And when we look at those, we can see that the standard ballast again is the one that performs pretty much the poorest. The first two variants were not adventurous enough, but the variant three, which had got the biggest proportion of smaller grains, again, gave us the interlocking that we needed without impairing the need for drainage function and fines carrying capacity. So again, we could change the ballast grading to try to reduce the rate of accumulation of settlement. We also looked at these random strips of fibres, but I'm not now that sure about the idea of putting bits of plastic in, in the ballast. But what these do do is they improve the ballast ductility. 
So this is the result of a triaxial test. We can see that the without the reinforcement, the ballast, OK, it's a bit of a stiffer response, but it goes to a peak strength and comes down. Whereas with the reinforcement, the ballast is, is just generally more ductile. And what it also does, it suppresses the tendency of the ballast to, to dilate or increase in volume as it approaches failure. Um, so there are some benefits there uh, in that potentially. And again, when we look at the results, we can see there is a small improvement, but to be fair, it's not actually as good as using the undersleeper pads or the regraded ballast. Since this, we've actually done some tests looking at rope like fibres and they tend to give us actually a better result. OK, now I mentioned the steep ballast shoulder. This photo was taken last September, pretty much on the border between the Netherlands and Germany. And you can see there the, the steepness of the of the ballast shoulder. And that's not untypical of many lines, both in the UK and overseas. So if we look at the standard test where that shoulder was a slope of about one in one and we look at the effect of reducing it to a slope of one in two, we can see that that has got a huge difference in reducing the rate of accumulation of plastic settlement. And if we take photographs of the shoulder and basically this is by subtracting the contrast, we can look at the difference between the start of the test, a quarter of a million cycles and the end of the test. The um, uh, where the particles have, have moved, um, we, we end up with this sort of white pattern, which is indicating a difference in the contrast. So the top one here is for the standard test with a shoulder slope of, of one to one. And then this one is for a shoulder slope of one to two. And we can see there's a lot less disturbance to the ballast. So we're seeing a lot less raveling of the ballast particles down the slope. We're seeing a lot less lateral spread. And so we also see a lot less settlement. If we put all the results together, we can see that the worst one is pretty much what we currently do. The best one is with the reduced profile slope. Almost anything else that we do um, in terms of putting it under sleeper pads or, cha or, or, or um, changing the grading of the ballast will actually give us a benefit. So does that happen in practice? Well, undersleeper pads are now pretty much standard in Austria, and that's really as a result of work done there in the University of Graz, and then they're beginning to be specified at certain locations on network rail. In Australia, the ballast grading, the standard ballast grading was, was changed following similar work by Buddha Rinder Ratner's group, then at Wollongong. We have got a field trial of the uh, reinforced fibre ballast, um, but we're still sort of awaiting the results of that from London Underground. But the most effective remedy, uh, which is reducing the shoulder slope or possibly confining the ballast laterally, hasn't really found any traction. But maybe it is just too difficult. So this is on the Highland line um, just south of Aviemore, and you can see that, you know, how could you reduce that ballast shoulder slope? Um, so some beautiful scenery, uh, but not really amenable to tr trying to stop the migration of ballast. OK. The other thing is that there is a sense in which we only ever seem to raise the track up. And I do have a view that when you look at the Plessy viaduct, you do wonder whether part of the reason for that spandrel wall failing was that over the years, the height of ballast had just been gradually increased, putting more and more pressure on the spandrel wall. So it does seem to be kind of, it's probably like entropy or something that the level of the ballast only ever goes up. We very rarely put it down. OK, so um, the next challenge is how do we predict that rate of, of track settlement? And of course, um, uh, so, so one of the things that we, we have done is to try to come up with a model which recognises the fact that below a certain load, we probably won't get any plastic strain, but above a certain load, we probably do start to get plastic strain within the cycle. The challenge is that, you know, even if you're to only talking about a nanometer of settlement every cycle, over a million cycles, that sort of adds up to, you know, nanometers add up to milli millimeters when you talk about millions of cycles. So we have actually developed a model uh, which uh, allows plastic strains to occur above a certain threshold. So yeah, you know, actually, you could go back to British Rail Research in you know, Shenton in the 1970s, who was also proposing that kind of approach. It seems to have dropped out of favour, but actually in soil mechanics terms, it's it's quite a nice approach. Uh, and when exceeded, the, the um, threshold stress will increase, but we also get plastic strains and the threshold stress has to be higher for higher stiffness materials. So this is the sort of basic stress strain law uh, that we have got for the material for forming the track bed. 
And uh, without going into all of the details, uh, which would be there for people to look up in the slide, um, we've compared the predicted settlement as a function of number of cycles. Um, so our model is this semi-analytical model here, and it lies between some of the empirical models, which are quite popular. So there's the Gurin model, the Froling model, and the Sato model. Um, as to which one of these is right, uh, it, we, we, we don't really know, because I think one of the problems is it's actually really quite difficult to get experimental data to validate any of the models that we have. Um, but it certainly is giving the right sort of behaviour, and it seems to be based on parameters that you can measure in the laboratory rather than sort of curve fit parameters, which meant many of the other models are, are based on. Part of the challenge, of course, is that the settlement isn't just due to the ballast. So if we look at the way that many of our earthworks were constructed, they were never really constructed according to modern principles. They were constructed by end tipping with no compaction. Uh, and then over the years, um, this is a, one of the embankments that we've been looking at for other purposes. <clears throat> and what it shows is that the embankment fill has gradually been topped up by ash so that actually probably 40% of the embankment height is top up material of ash. And that is one of the reasons why it's really quite difficult to try to predict the settlements of the track. And it's also possible that one of the reasons that we have the ballast mounted that we very often do is because actually that ballast has been placed to top up settlement of the embankment. So that again <clears throat> adds another complicating factor. OK, so moving on from settlement now, we're going to look at the effect of the, I call it the rail support system stiffness. This is basically the effect of the track bed, any undersleeper pad and also the rail pad. So it's what the train sees when it travels across a rail. And we traditionally analyze this as a beam on an elastic foundation. So in essence, we model the rails, so they have a certain EI value, a certain bending stiffness, and then the rail support stiffness, or in this slide, the track support stiffness, models the effects of the rail pads, the understeeper pads, the ballast, the subgrade, everything that's going on. And it's uh, defined as the load per sleeper end or per unit length of the track that causes a unit deflection. So why is track stiffness important? So if we look at the results of the analysis, the top picture shows the calculated displacements for three different values of rail support stiffness. There's a flexible one, which is 10 meganewtons per metre squared, an intermediate one, which is 20 meganewtons per metre squared, and then a stiff support, which is 40 meganewtons per metre squared. So the obvious thing is, as we would expect, that as we increase the stiffness, the maximum deflection reduces. But there are also other things going on, in particular that the, um, the deflection bowl narrows as we, as, 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 we, as we increase the stiffness. So basically the load is spread along a shorter length of track. And also as we increase the support stiffness, the recovery between axles becomes more, more pronounced. So the problem with that is that those latter two things mean that the local stresses tend to increase as the support stiffness uh, is, is increased. So that leads us to the idea that the support stiffness mustn't be too hard because then the stresses are too high. It mustn't be too soft because then the displacements are too high, but it needs to be just right. And importantly, it needs to be reasonably uniform. So that's some um, that's uh, Goldilocks is sleeping in baby bear's bed because <clears throat> daddy bear's was too hard, mummy bear's was too soft, but baby bear's bed was uh, just right. Okay, ah, that's my background. So we're going to have a quick look at the effect of variations in track level and in rail support system stiffness. And we're going to look at some insights which are based on a survey of 350 sleepers on HS1 and uh, combined with vehicle track interaction modelling. The deflection and the stiffness were measured using MEMS accelerometers, so we need to integrate that signal twice to get from an acceleration to a deflection. There is also a clever bit of signal processing we can do, uh, which is about the ratio of harmonic peaks that enables us to back out the effective rail support system stiffness without having to know the train weight. But the absolute levels were measured using the old fashioned way using a total station. 
So the sort of data that we get are that these are the deflections along the run of uh, uh, 350 sleepers. I think these are under a javelin train. And you can see that generally the track is pretty well behaved with deflections down at less than a millimetre, but every so often we seem to get a lesser supported bit that gives us a spike in the deflection. And then when we back out the effective stiffness modulus, we can see that that's possibly a bit more variable. Um, but again, where we have got the very big peaks in deflection, not surprisingly, we have got low points in the support stiffness, then the same would be true here and there. So the two are sort of related. So what sort of difference does that make to the wheel rail forces? So at this point, because we can't measure the real wheel, wheel rail forces um, in the same way, we have to turn to a vehicle track interaction model. So we model the vehicle as a, a multi-body system. So there's a vehicle body, secondary suspension, bogies, primary suspension, the wheels. It goes along the track, which has a certain EI value. And then we've modeled the track. There's a rail pad stiffness, the sleeper, which has a mass. There is a, a ballast stiffness and then a foundation and so all of this lot is contributing to the stiffness so we looked at four cases we did one simulation where we took the measured level and we assumed a uniform track modulus of 30 megapascals we then took a, an idealized smooth level and used the measured modulus we then took the measured level and the measured modulus and finally we took the measured level and the measured modulus but we introduced some voids or hanging sleepers so if we look at the first set of results this is the measured initial track level uh, and uh, so this is the, the, the measured level here um and um that uh, and with, with the so 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 the analysis used the measured initial level and the measured modulus, the measured deflections are the faint ones here, but the simulated deflections are very very uniform. So interestingly, there the simulated deflections don't really uh, depend very much on the level, they, but, but they do depend on the modulus. If we now take the second simulation, we assumed a smooth initial track level, but the measured modulus, and we can see there that we're getting uh, a little bit um, better agreement between the measured and simulated deflections. With the measured initial track level and the measured modulus, again, there's reasonable agreement, but it's really not very different um, from the second simulation. Then finally, we can get better agreement in some of these places here where there are big anomalies by simulating voids below the track. So that gives us a reasonable degree of confidence of where we've got these very big deflections. That's an indication that we've got a void or a hanging sleeper. So what does it do to the wheel rail contact forces? Well, this is with the measured initial track level and the modulus of 30 megapascals. So that's quite rough because we've got the initial level. But if we have a smooth initial track level and the measured modulus, actually the measured modulus switching from the me measured modulus to the constant modulus doesn't really do very much for the wheel rail contact force. This one here is the measured initial track level and the measured modulus we see is actually fairly similar to the top one. And then we've got a few more bumps in here when we put in the voids. So um, what does all of that tell us? It tells us that the sleeper deflections depend more on the support stiffness than on the track level. And if we really want to get agreement, modeling the voids is important. But it also tells us that the wheel rail contact forces depend more on the track level than on the support stiffness, although voiding again is potentially locally important. So that's sort of interesting because uh, what it really is telling us is that for for uniform wheel rail contact forces, we don't necessarily need a uniform stiffness. We do need uh, a uniform level and we do need to avoid hanging sleepers. And this is sort of borne out by measurements that we've made at a number of sites. So these are the range of movement for different sites and different classes of trains. This is the inferred support system modulus. And all of these would be viewed as well performing track. And what's interesting is that actually uh, the movement range is in some cases quite large. That's where the stiffness is low. Um, and also interestingly, where we've got the biggest range of movement, we've possibly got the smallest range of stiffness, but that's because it's a low stiffness, so it tends to amplify the effect. Um, but essentially, we probably are not going to get a uniform track support stiffness. 
And the focus should really be not so much on a uniform stiffness as avoiding hanging sleepers and trying to make sure that we've got the level right, because those are the things that really sort of impact the performance. OK, so um, those are some sort of historic things that we've done. What I would now like to do is just to have a quick look at some current projects and some projected future work. So we're going to look at some work we've been doing on the performance of complex crossings, trying to relate on train to trackside measurement data. All of the stuff that I've been talking about so far is uh, trackside measurement data. Uh, we look at the performance of plane line following track bed renewal, uh, transitions onto and off under bridges. Then something which was uh, triggered by the very hot weather that we had in 2022, which is improving the lateral resistance of sleepers to prevent track buckling. Uh, and then I don't think I've got much on the performance of reuse ballast, but that is an ongoing thing that we are looking at. So the performance of complex crossing, this is field monitoring of a switch and crossing at Coglow Junction, which is uh, just where the Bristol line from Taunton turns off from the, the, the line into Paddington. So we have measured vertical and lateral accelerations uh, of, of, of the track and also the bearer vertical deflections. And we've looked at seeing whether we can correlate those measured bearer deflections with NMT data, uh, but they're actually measuring different things. So we've deployed about more than 100 triaxial accelerometers along the switch and crossing, and then they've been processed to give accelerations and bearer deflections. And each individual red dot is an accelerometer. So they will give us the acceleration in all three directions, vertical, lateral, longitudinal. And the diagram here points out certain features such as a weld, a crossing weld, um, different welds, uh, IBJs, um, a change of base plate, points operating equipment and so on, and the hollow bearer. So all of those are sort of features which potentially disrupt the uniformity of the transition through the switch. So these are the data of vertical accelerations. These are raw accelerations. And what's some, uh, they're for two different types of train. They're for the Intercity Express train and the HST, and they are filtered to 40 hertz now, and, and to 200 hertz. Now, up to 40 hertz, it's that kind of frequency which is likely to feed into possible movements. 200 hertz, you're looking at the higher frequency uh, vibrations, which oh, they're not going to be on for long enough to actually cause significant movements. So what we can see, uh, this is basically left rail, right rail. We can see, first of all, that the um, accelerations associated with the higher frequencies, which are sort of these two here and those two there, are actually generally much greater than the accelerations associated with the lower frequencies. Um, so uh, those are the sort of 40 hertz, and then these ones are the, the 200 hertz. Uh, there's also quite an inter interesting contrast there between the, uh, the, um, the, the IET and the HST. And the second point of interest is that, you know, nearly all of these places where we're getting high accelerations are associated with welds or joints. Not always, because some of the welds are actually quite good, points operating equipment and, and even the hollow bearer. So, you know, all of those features do have potentially quite a big effect. And even at the lower frequency end, you know, these ones here are going to translate into additional movement at that switch and crossing. So these are the lateral accelerations, and again, we can see that actually the worst picture is given by the high frequency um, uh, vibrations. The lower frequency vibrations are probably actually not so bad. Um, so again, we can see though that the peaks are usually associated with particular features such as welds and um, other bits of equipment that we put on the crossing. So. Can we in any sense compare the deflections? So by integrating the vertical accelerations twice, we can get uh, steeper deflections. So the bearer deflections are these dotted lines here. There's the dotted lines, and these are the data that we get from the new measurement train on track level. And you see that they're really not, you, you can sometimes think, oh, well, maybe there's a correlation there, but it is not consistent. 
And that's not really a surprise because these are actually measuring two completely different things. Um, that the, the 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 train is probably measuring uh, either the loaded or the unloaded level, depending on where you put it. And so that's a combination of the initial level of the track and possibly what happens as the train goes past. What we're measuring with our devices on the track is independent of the initial level of the track. We're measuring how much it deflects. So. We shouldn't really waste too much energy, I think, in terms of trying to correlate these two things completely. So to summarise that, the higher frequency accelerations are much larger than the lower frequency accelerations, but it's the low frequency ones that govern deflections. The major accelerations are associated with features such as weld and the welds and the crossing nose. And then finally, the on track and the on train and the track side devices actually are measuring different things. They're measuring different things. The track side devices give us deflections over a much smaller scale and their use is really in identifying isolated defects, which it wouldn't, it just isn't really possible from uh, from the wavelength results from the on-train sensors. Okay, another current project is this one. So this is uh, been very much been run by Ben Lee, who might or might not be on the course. Ben Lee of Network Rail, this is his sort of baby. This is um, some permanent instrumentation installed at a site at Lemster, and I think it's always been a problematic site. So we have got some uh, total pressure cells and vibrating wire pizometers that are actually buried in the track bed that happened during a renewal. We have got wired low noise MEMS accelerometers, and we've also got some uh, optical fibers, some on the rail and some below the track, and we're doing periodic surveying. So the sort of data that we're getting from this site, uh, this is the passage of a, a drive driving van trailer, Mark IV coaches, the class 67. It's filtered to the lower frequencies that we're interested in for deflections. These are the raw accelerations. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, and, 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 and then we, we can um, uh, we can integrate those twice to get the displacement. So we can see very clearly there the passage of each individual axle. The, an artifact of the filtering and the processing is that you appear to get this ramp up and ramp down. The, es the estimated deflection is the sort of peak to peak in the middle. So we're getting there a deflection of probably something like um, uh, a, a millimetre. So it's, you know, it's forming reasonably well. This would be the locomotive because it's um, heavier and it's giving us a bigger deflection. If we actually look at the deflection under the Mark IV coaches, um, we can plot the steeper deflection and how does that vary by season? So the blue line there is the winter 2022, the green line there is summer 2022, that's autumn and winter. And there is very much a trend there, which is that the winter deflections are bigger than the summer deflections and that's probably as a result of the change in the moisture content of the subgrade um, which is associated with those seasonal conditions and I don't think that's been measured before we haven't really measured something for this purpose before and I think that has implications because if we look at uh, the effects of climate change we're possibly going to see subgrades becoming a bit wetter and that means that we could end up with slightly bigger deflections so these are transient deflections these are dynamic deflections as the train goes past. Um, we've also got the pressure cell data, which is interesting. So this is the total pressure as a train goes past. So again, you can see the effect of the heavier locomotive. So that's actually quite interesting. I'm a great skeptic when it comes to um, measuring pressures with those pressure cells, but these results do actually seem to be sort of quite reasonable. And then it's a different time scale but how much of that increase in load comes onto the pore water pressure? And what we can see there is that there is a, a tiny increase in pore. You know, this is this is 0.1 of a kilopascal, so it's almost nothing. Um, and then it decays, and the the time scales of the two are different. So we've got a. This is basically um, uh, it 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 it's it's a uh, it's it, as I say it's a different time scale. So so it, the the decay is is really quite 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 rapid um so so that's that's interesting but uh, we're in the process of sort of working out how we can use all of that and what it means the optical fiber measurements are quite interesting so these are optical fibers which are glued to the rail so they will give us an indication of the stresses in the rail as the train goes past we've also got optical fibers buried in the track and uh the 
the there was a bit of an issue in installing it so that the one installed in the track uh, uh, does not go across the whole of the, the site. So this is the extent of the one installed on the rail. That's the one installed on the track. But where we have got data from both of them, we can actually look at the effects of the train passage. So we end up with this is a time distance diagram. So the train going across is, is giving us this sort of um, linear line that goes up. And what we can see is that in in the in the track bed, we're actually getting um, uh, as, uh, different strains, but they are mirroring those which are in the rail. Um, so what we what we're seeing there is the effect of the train going across. And what that enables us to do is to compare that with the results of an analysis, and we can start to begin to verify the effects of analysis. Um, so we've also been looking at the uh, transitions onto and off an underbridge. So this is uh, at a place called Wanborough in uh, in um, in Surrey, and uh, this is a sort of classic situation that we have an embankment on either side of a bridge, and so the concern is about essentially rough riding over the bridge here. So again, this has been a, a, a monitoring campaign for a, a, a number of, um, a, a, of different sleepers, number of different sensors. So the sort of data that we've been getting from this, so this is for a class 450 EMU. These are the accelerations that we've been measuring as the train goes over. These are the displacements. Uh, so they're just the accelerations integrated twice. So, you know, actually the displacements aren't horrendous. They're probably less than a millimeter if we take the if we take the, the, the peak to peak. So how does that then vary as we go along the length? So these are accelerations, these deflections, and then this is the inferred system support modulus. This is the location of the underbridge. So we've got a few sort of little problem areas there, but we can see that coming onto and especially off the bridge um, is causing big accelerations and potentially big deflections. And what's probably happened there is that the geometry has probably sort of, we've had a degree of compaction of the underlying material. So it wouldn't be a surprise if actually some of these sleepers, uh, as we come off the bridge, were actually, were actually hanging, and that is a bit of a problem. So again, the intention with those data is to use them to develop and validate models that we can then use to predict how these things can be addressed in the future. OK, so we've also been looking at the lateral stability of track, and that is in the context of some of the hot summers that we saw in 2022, uh, looking at the resistance to that buckling. So. Uh, again, in our rig test in the laboratory, we've been doing some tests, but rather than looking at the effects of vertical loading, we've been doing lateral push tests, and we have looked at the um, resistance of individual sleepers. So there's a G44 without an undersleeper pad, which is the blue one here. There are various composite sleepers with dimples and teeth. There's a timber sleeper. Uh, this one is interesting. It's a G44 with an undersleeper pad. And that's giving us uh, a quite a considerably improved horizontal resistance, which is uh, this is just one of a series of tests, which is a work in progress. Again, I think it comes back to the thing that I was saying earlier that what we're doing is we're spreading the load over a bigger area. And if you want to move something a heavy weight, you normally sort of put it on a couple of scaffold poles or rails and then you can push it. If you just try to push it along the ground, you can't do it. And that's exactly the effect that we're seeing here. We've got a greater resistance by something which has got a more uniform contact. Uh, it's much more difficult to push. Um, so we have looked at uh, with this one, we have looked also at any difference between fresh ballast used ballast which has been cleaned and then used ballast which has still got potentially fouling material in place. So this is just a picture of the of the rig which actually shows it in the setup for the push test. The one on the left here is with no heap above the ballast shoulder. So we can see that actually interestingly the worst behavior is the um, ballast which has still got the contaminating material in it. The fresh ballast is better, but the used clean ballast is actually slightly higher. If we put on a little uh, heap by the side of the shoulder, 125 millimetres high, 
um, we can see that actually that first of all muddies the water in terms of which of these is better, although it is actually slightly the used clean ballast. But it also gives us maybe a little bit more resistance, but perhaps it's not huge. Um, so that's the sort of thing that we've been looking at, as well as different types of sleepers. We've been looking at the effect of a shoulder heap and also whether we should you know, the, the, whether it's a bad thing to use um, recovered clean ballast. But from the basis of the tests in terms of lateral stability, it doesn't seem that that is the case. The other thing that we've been doing on that is actually then doing an analysis to look at what is what are the conditions for buckle. So this is a sort of classic buckling diagram. It plots the a stable displacement uh, as a function of the temperature above the stress free temperature. So where we have got a strong lateral support, so a lot of lateral resistance, what we find is that we go to a high temperature, but then the system buckles and then it next becomes stable at a much bigger displacement. So it wouldn't be able to, it wouldn't be an equilibrium on any of this part of the curve. If you actually got to the T max, you would shoot across in a buckle straight to this big lateral deflection. As the lateral support becomes less strong, we find that that peak and trough effect reduces until with weak lateral support, it just goes. So the disbenefit of weak lateral support is that, um, is that we don't get the disbenefit is that we get a lower maximum temperature, but the benefit is that we don't get this brittle oil panning or pop through behavior. So those are the results um, plotted from a static analysis, and we're plotting there uh, for an initial misalignment. Um, we've got weak, medium and strong ballast support, and this is the range. And what we find is actually as the misalignment increases, we also find that this type of behavior reduces. It led to quite an interesting debate. When is it when is it a misalignment and when is it a buckle? Um, and perhaps some of you might have some views on that. So the next step was to move that into a dynamic analysis where we have a, a multi body train running along. So we can pick up that there is potentially an unloading of the track in front of and behind the train. And uh, what these diagrams show is the position after the passage of a train for different stress free temperatures or sorry, different temperatures above the stress free temperature of 10, 20, 30 and 40 degrees, different train speeds. And these are all for an initial 22 millimeter misalignment. So what you see is that actually for a, 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 a low temperature above the stress free temperature, it doesn't really matter too much, although speed is worse. There will come a point here where actually at a 30 degrees above the stress free temperature, you would be OK at a low speed, but you wouldn't want to run at a high speed. And then for 40 degrees above the te stress free temperature, you wouldn't want to run at any speed. And in some sense, that does kind of um, confirm what I believe is the current hot weather management strategy that up to a, that up to a certain temperature, OK? Above that temperature, you'd put on a speed restriction and above and above another temperature, you'd stop running trains. So uh, the devil, of course, is in working out what those numbers are. OK, so that brings us on to uh, the conclusion. So hopefully we'll still have about 10 minutes or so for questions. So various interventions can reduce the rate of plastic settlement of the ballast. Some, like under sleeper pads and revised ballast grading, have been adopted around the world. Reducing the ballast shoulder slope or containing the ballast, which is arguably the most effective, it's also the least adopted. When we come to look at the effects of the subgrade, including the effects of possibly climate change on the subgrade, we do need to have better soil mechanics based models for predicting the development of plastic settlement. And I've shown some ways in which we started to develop those, but that is very much a work in progress. We've seen that variations in track level and hanging sleepers um, are much more damaging than variations in continuous track support stiffness. Uh, what we really need to try to do is make sure that um, we can get the track as level as close to its design level as possible and avoid hanging sleepers and maybe not worry too much about minor variations in track support stiffness. We've also seen that detecting stuff from on train measurements of the type that we detect from our line side instruments is difficult because they're actually measuring different things and the wavelength is different and we haven't got the physics models. We've seen that the sleeper and ballast type and geometry can all influence the lateral resistance of sleepers to trap buckling. And I think that with regard to the crossings, um, you look at that complexity of the crossing, we need better understanding. Uh, and we also need to try to design out some of those stresses like the welds. OK, 
Okay. Uh, acknowledge a large number of people have helped to carry out this work. Obviously, I haven't done it all myself. Um, we didn't get the music today, but also the research has been supported by Network Rail, Network Rail High Speed, HS2 and the um, Interrail European project. Uh, and that brings us to the end. And I think I'll stop sharing at that point uh, and see if there's see if we've got time for any questions. Wow. That was certainly was a whistle stop tour. Uh, William, thank you very much indeed. You covered an awful lot of, of ground there. And yes, we do have a few comments and questions in the chat here. And people can are welcome to open up their microphone and ask it themselves. So Ian, if you're still here, you were asking questions about uh, ballast gluing. If you want to unmute and ask, talk about it. Yeah. Brian Whitney anecdotally had stated uh, that gluing of ballast shoulders to provide increased uh, lateral stability also had a net benefit of providing some containment for the ballast within the forefoot. So they'd also noted that not only had they improved lateral stability, but they'd seen an improvement in the uh, in the top geometry for a, a longer period of time between maintenance intervals. What's your thoughts on that? So I've I've always thought that um, ballast gluing would be a good thing. Uh, and actually, I think it's completely consistent with what I've shown. I think a lot of the settlement that we get in the rig is actually due to lateral spreading. If you can contain the lateral spreading and actually a perfectly legitimate way of doing that would be to create a beam of glued ballast along the shoulder, uh, then I think it is completely consistent with the mechanisms that we've identified in the talk. I think people, the, I think nervousness about ballast gluing comes about because, you know, people, it means different things to different people. So some, there's been one scheme which sort of fills all the gaps with urethane, which you wouldn't want to do. Um, people sometimes say, well, when it's glued, you can't tamp it. But actually, if you're only gluing the shoulders, that wouldn't matter. The Zytrac thing, which I thought was quite clever because the idea was it made sort of um, ballast grains. It made it wasn't particularly a gluing thing. It gave you interlocking by filling in some of the voids. So as long as that's not a drainage issue. But I think that at least one application of Zytrac worked mainly because it, it, it locked up the shoulder. So actually the, the benefit of the ballast beam was not in terms of vertical loading. It was in stopping lateral spreading. And, you know, I, you know, from my own experience at home, if I've got a sort of decorative gravel that I don't want to fly around too much, I tend to just sort of glue it together with a watered down PVA solution. And it's amazingly robust. It comes back to the idea that actually a little stress over a big area gives you quite a big, a lot of robustness, the big load. So I, I you know, we've not tested uh, in the rig um, ballast gluing, but I definitely think, you know, if you're going to glue it, glue the shoulders and stop that lateral spread, because I think, I think what we try to, you know, at one level with our tests, you can say, well, yeah, we just loaded it and saw how much it moved. But it is actually more than that because we've got like the pressure paper and we've got the the optical measurements and all the rest of it. We've actually identified the mechanisms by how as to how this settlement develops. And I think that's what enables you to say, well, okay, although we haven't tried the ballast gluing, it should work. It should have a benefit. So I'd be very much in favour of giving it a go because I think it's uh, it 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 should be relatively cost effective and it it should should work well i'll drop i'll drop you an email after this uh lecture yeah and, brilliant uh, no okay yeah it's fantastic no it'd be great to hear from, from you yeah right. thank you thanks yeah thank you okay so there's another question here from james edwards james i don't know if you want to open your microphone and, and um raise the question yourself he's talking about ballast steps yeah thank you yeah i was just going to ask um if any of the ballast steps have been you know adjusted for those horizontal displacements uh, when no. I was working in oh, Australia yeah. on Queensland yeah. Rail they had um, some quite strict clauses about exceeding kind of 400 mil ballast steps and you know the the horizontal um, impact so we've done all of ours on a standard bed of 300 millimeters um so when you exceeded the depth did did the, did the resistance reduce or increase uh, it was just to see um, what your findings have been. Okay, uh, it, was, okay, it was more okay. Queen, Queensland Rail that uh, kind right, of mandated okay. in their standards yeah. that, you know, don't so, exceed 400. Yes, um, I mean, I would have thought that actually at 300, you're probably not impacting the bottom of the rig. Um, so I, 
I would I think that with a greater depth of ballast, it's probably sort of other things coming into play as well. Um, so I think if we did it with 400, I don't I wouldn't expect to see a difference. But on the other hand, if we did it with 400 and we were looking at the interaction between vertical settlements and horizontal settlement, then I think that could come into play. So I suspect that's possibly what they were looking at. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. But, but thanks for that heads up. I think that's something that we'll have a look at. So we've only got a few a few minutes left now, William. Can I ask a question myself? So obviously you've covered an awful lot of material today and I'm interested to understand where have you seen all that research have the biggest influence in actually like driving a change in how people do things? So I think it. Um, arguably, I think one of the biggest influences has probably been on the lateral resistance, because I think that some of those tests, I think there is I think some of those tests will probably find their way into a standard. And I think, you know, there's a particular sort of thing about the use of undersleeper pads and the fact that probably it can give you as much benefit as a lateral resistance plate, but it's a lot easier to fit, certainly if you're fitted at the start. So I think uh, we've done other bits and pieces as well that I've not talked about today, um, but I think sort of generally uh, the biggest influence occurs when you've got some way of getting it into a standard. Um, so some work we did on the mark pile depths for electrification. So I'm quite interested in the next talk actually why the mass so big, <laughs> because the thing that I got involved is, in was why are the foundation so big, um, and uh, you know actually tying it into a standard was really quite important about getting that to land. I think it's um, it would be nice to see some of the ideas for reducing the ongoing settlement implemented. Um, but then some of the individual monitoring, which I didn't talk about today. So we actually worked with Network Rail High Speed to identify some particular individual defects. So at an under track crossing, at a transition from a slab track to a ballast track, uh, at an expansion joint onto a bridge. So we, what we did is we went out with our devices. We measured exactly how much movement was happening. And then they use that to decide how much they would do by essentially manual packing rather than sending a tamper through. And what we found was that the repair that was done in that way lasted for months as long as we carried on monitoring it, whereas sending the tamper through would either make it better or it, and if it made it better, it would only be temporary if it made, but usually it made it worse. So I think that maybe the use of the instruments to really understand what's going on in the case of isolated defects has been one area. And I think the other area is probably that lateral resistance stuff, because I think that will find its way. That's beginning to find its way into into what people do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we've got lots of comments in the chat, William, that are all saying fantastic presentation. Like you've covered so much information and um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm sure we'd all like to show our appreciation in, in the usual manner and use the virtual hand clapping um, that we can we can enact. Uh, oh, hang on, we've got one more question okay. coming in before Who, whoever. So Hugh, you've got your hand up. We've got time for one more question if you're quick. And apologies, I, was, uh, I misdirected clap. That's all right. Okay. Oh, it's a misdirected clap. Oh, that's no bother. Oh, well, hang on. No, oh, no, I think okay. that's all right. You're OK. You're OK. So thank thank you very much. And thank you all for listening very patiently. And I am i don't know whether I mean, I'm very happy if anybody wants to follow anything up, just drop me an email and, um, you know, we can we can take it from there. Uh, we actually had a visit to the lab for the Wessex section, I think, back yes. end of last year. I'm happy to run that again later this year if there's interest. So, you know, just let us know. Yes, indeed. William is very supportive of the PWI and uh, very welcoming of, of anyone that wants to have a look around, I think, if you can get it organised. Um, so thank you very much. And just to remind everyone, two weeks time, that next presentation is all about the Great Western Electrification. Why are the maths so big? So so hopefully you'll all join that as well. A great turnout today. Thank you. Okay, Thanks brilliant. a lot, William. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, bye. 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 bye.